Hello, Sunlit Ones. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Welcome back. It is so wonderful to have you here for the book club. We're talking about The Sunlit Man. We have kind of a sequel of sorts. Yeah, we are picking up kind of in the middle of Sigzel's story. Where we left him last in our final episode was that he had taken the Dawn Shard upon himself and is now sort of fleeing Rashar. So I consider this his like nomad period when he is literally a nomadic person right and then the story the sunlit man is kind of how he leaves his nomadic period yeah exactly and uh, that's where we will finish or conclude this episode of him nomad becoming zellian a new person with a new spirit web and all that fun jazz that goes with it another interesting note about his name is that nomad not only is Uh, indicative of the life that he is living during this time. But he says that it also sounds a little bit like his original name in Azish. Right, because Zigzil is not his original Azish name. I think Zigzil is, but maybe it sounds different in Azish. Yeah, I don't think that's too uncommon to imagine a person moving from one society to another adopting a name of sorts but not their birth name so you think that sigzel is maybe his alethi name his alethi name yes and not his birth name again Hmm. this is just speculation based on that point yeah it doesn't actually say that in the book but i think it is ambiguous it's left sort of up to us to ponder as we are currently (laughs) what we do know is that long before he arrives on canticle he's nomadic and he is moving around the cosmere at a pace that maybe no one else has done his ability with the dawn shard part of the blessing part of the curse is to be able to without any type of perpendicularity he is able to seemingly move physically through the cosmere without also going through the cognitive realm Right. It's not that he has access to the surge of transportation or anything like that. He just gets this skipping as part of his torment, sort of. It's like just part of the side effect of having been a Dawn Shard holder. And Hoyd does say that he presumes that Nomad has seen more of the Cosmere than Hoyd by the time of the Sunlit Man, which seems really impressive. It means that there has been a bunch of movement because we know that Hoyt is basically visited everywhere worth visiting. You know, story worthy moments are where Hoyt shows up. And he's been bopping around for millennia. So if Sigzel has already seen more of the Cosmere than Hoyt has, he's moving much, much quicker and more often than Hoyt to have seen more in a shorter period of time, a significantly shorter period of time. And I think it could have something to do with what we talked about in our last episode is that the Dawn Shard seems to have an ability to like connect itself or connect its holder to the rest of the Cosmere in yeah. a unique way. And so I think one aspect is that Zigzil, now Nomad, is moving to places that Hoyd never would even think to go. Right. Well, because he is also hiding. Right. And so exactly. he is probably purposefully going to places other people, particularly Hoyd, would not want to go to. Right. I think Hoyd has probably been to Skadril a bunch of times. Right. And we've seen several of those times, but maybe has never been to Canticle And why would you? I mean, there's just a circle of death going around the planet. So it's not exactly high on anybody's visit list. (laughs) Yeah, it's not a vacation destination. But then again, neither would we expect Ashen, the planet in the Rasharan system that was destroyed by the humans. And yet it is stated clearly in the text that Nomad does visit Ashen and specifically a floating city on Ashen. But Ashen is at least close to his home planet. So that makes sense to me that like the first places you would go, because we also suspect that he's been to Braze 
We you talked know? about that, yeah, last so, time. So, yeah, it, it makes more sense to me that the first places you start exploring are going to be the planets closest to yours. Certainly, but I'm just more amazed at the idea of a floating city on Ashen. Oh. And, like, a group of people still there that seemingly, like, well, survived. Well, I guess or... we don't know if the city is populated. Oh, that's a good point. You're saying yeah. it could have been, like, the remnants of... Yeah, the city, city might still be there. That doesn't mean there's people there. Well, floating implies, to me, some type of effort. Like, for example, the flying cities of the people of Canticle mm-hmm. are machines, many yeah. machines all pushed together for their survival, I would think that there has to be some type of maintenance in order to remain floating. No, it could just be part of the physics of the planet, like how the trees and the plants on Yumi's world float. Yes, the kind of like pendulum avoiding the will of gravity and seemingly just skipping over the trees. Yeah, so if... You know, there are just sort of floating islands on Ashen as oh, part of what the planet is, you know, and then you build your cities on those islands and then they're floating. Or maybe even part of the destruction of Ashen was cities, you know, trying to remain protected. They have some surges. We know that in the past mm. there was some type of surge on Ashen. And so maybe they were able to like protect their city from destruction and use the surges to like lift it up. I'm thinking kind of like in Avengers, one of them, when the villain like lifts a whole city up and then drops it on Sokovia, I think is what it is. Oh, maybe. But yeah, if they were purposefully lifting the city up to like avoid what's happening on the ground. Yeah, then, well, I and depending on what kind of magic they're using, right? Like maybe the magic is stable enough that it can stay after the people are gone. We don't know. Who knows? It could be literally anything. <laughs> I have to now get to Ashen and, and <laughs> hopefully, you know, Nomad can show me around because he doesn't stop there. This is, like you said, just the beginning of his exploration. We also know that he's either been to Threnody or is very familiar with Threnody, the shades. He said he was almost eaten by a shade and yeah. seemingly has knowledge of the Threnodites long before arriving on Canticle. Yeah, he recognizes them when he sees them basically by their their clothing and their language and their names. So he obviously has some familiarity with their culture. I think we can probably assume that he has been to Threnody uh, because of that almost being eaten by a shade. Um, But we see on Canticle that they have a diaspora. So maybe he ran into them somewhere else as well. Yeah, that's a good point. We don't know how the Threnodites have spread. And I think it's really interesting to maybe revisit Threnody at some point because of the situation there that like seemingly led a bunch of people to flee cross continent is what we saw with silence but we also know that some people like left the planet and like how many groups left the planet where did they end up we're gonna have an entire episode about the the Threnodites I'm so excited but let's stay focused (laughs) on Nomad because in his utility belt that he's collecting across the Cosmere. He also learns all about Scadrial and can read Scadrian, which we would know as Malwish, I believe. Maybe. I think what is said by the people from Scadrial, the like terrible scientist who I hate, yeah. is that Malwish is now the common language on Scadrial. No, she just says like, do you speak a civilized language like Malwish? That doesn't mean that Malwish is the only language on Scadrial. No, right? no, like just like the main sent, one. If we sent ambassadors somewhere, they might be like, do you speak French? That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only language. Right. They're just, they obviously consider anyone from Scadrial like, more civilized than Canticle, which is a backwater, you know, death trap. But they also see Malwish as the referable language like French would have been in the past in Europe or like English is today. That's or a that big person market. person just happens to be Malwish. Mm, yeah. Maybe. I think yeah. this is a bigger statement about what has happened on Scadrial so. that the Malwish have like taken over culturally or societally. I, I think that's a big step. You guys let me I know think... who's in favor of <laughs> oh me. Gosh. Once again, the fight begins and I think I think obviously in the time since we've seen them last, we already see 
the Ellendelians and the Malwish having more contact, communicating more, like those cultures are only going to get more and more enmeshed as we get more and more couples like Marasi and Alec, uh, you know, like they're going to start amalgamating. I'm imagining it more like Southern California, where you're equally likely to hear English and Spanish. That's a great call. I mean, I agree. But like both of those languages are and- indicative of where you're from and the the society that you're pulling from. If you like, yeah. they said if they visited another place on earth and someone from Southern California said, do you speak Spanish? That would be more indicative of where they came from and what they think about Spanish. It might be saying that like the Malwish are people who were more likely to travel and like spread their culture yeah. off of Skadril rather than, again, just speculation, but like the Ellendelites the Ellendelians may have become more entrenched entrenched yes and like inwardly focused isolationist defensive perhaps from all of the events that they have maybe faced recently it's just yeah. a speculation of course but i think it's interesting to hear it is interesting for sure and we know that nomad is able to read scadrian whatever that language is <laughs> whether it's Malwish or the Elendel language. I don't know if it has a name. Do they ever name their language? I guess no, because t- to them they're the only thing on the planet, so it would just yeah, be scattered. It doesn't even need a name, really. right? Exactly. Yeah. They would just be saying like Earthian, like we speak Earthian. <laughs> Yeah, just like the universal language. Yeah, because to them, there's only one. Everybody was like reborn. They don't know about the Malwish. Yeah. And that's why I think it is so interesting that these people would mention Malwish at all. It clearly yeah. means that the the favor and the focus of that basin has diminished in some respects. We just don't know how or what that means specifically. Yeah. What about most recently? Because he has just skipped to Canticle. Where did he come from? He says most recently he was on a cavern planet. So we don't know anything more about that. It may or may not be a shard world, but a planet of caverns. Yes, I am just going to drop this off. Caverns are a great place to find mushrooms. Maybe those mushrooms are magical and it's a link between the Cosmere, and the Skyward series because, of course, latest in the Skyward flight is coming out. What's that? Defiant? Yes, Defiant. Coming out at the end of this month. So my brain is all up in that world right now. Yeah. And I still want some connection, even though Brandon has assured us. There is no connection. Except for mushrooms. That's the only connection which connects all things. (laughs) Love it. Love all of you. We also hear that Nomad has been through, quote, many varieties of hell, end quote. This is of note because silence, threnody, and the forests of hell, but the concept of many versions of hell. Yeah. So I think we can say he's been to Braze. He's hell. been to Threnody. Hell. Yeah, two different versions of hell. And then if he really is just skipping through the Cosmere, kind of looking for planets to hide on, I imagine you are going to find some crappy planets right. that are pretty terrible. And there's so many planets that are seemingly occupied by some type of species that have nothing to do with shards on them. The... Maybe. Have we seen that? No, I No, I don't think that we have seen that. I think that it has been speculated in words of Brandon that like the Cosmere is bigger than just shard worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I wonder, maybe he's been to the original planet from Aether of Night, which gets like destroyed in the end, maybe. Yeah, we heard from Twin Soul that his home planet was destroyed. And we- Like I imagine that would be creepy. To go to a destroyed planet with Aethers, and you've never seen Aethers before? Yes, their aliveness is going to up the creepiness by (laughs) quite a bit. But it's a good place to hide. You know, hiding in kind of the destruction, hiding away from major action. He's kind of like the opposite of Hoyd in some ways. Like, if there's a story worth telling, Nomad does not want to be there. Exactly. (laughs) And then one more thing that we hear about his travels through the Cosmere is Ox uh, tells us that sort of as he's traveling around, Nomad continues to start legends. 
the actions that he takes on these various planets, you know, immediately sort of start stories within that culture of the world hopper. It would be impossible not to. We just witnessed on Canticle like that his very existence mixed with his specific oaths and his history as a windrunner and a skybreaker basically does not allow him to stay out of the limelight. And so I can just imagine a similar story happening ever. He shows up on a planet, someone's being mean, pops an attitude, and then he is like, ugh. I'm going to deal with this too. Maybe, and- but it also seems like the Sunlit Man is the first time that this has happened, at least in a long time. Maybe a long time because he see- has decades and decades of doing this, skipping around the yeah. Cosmere. I could see it being a case of wherever he goes, the Night Brigade finds him and, you know, stirs up trouble. And then he's having to do sort of a hijinks of stealing a vehicle to run away or like convincing someone to hide him and trying to get investiture until he can skip away again. Yeah, but okay, let's be honest. Is Han Solo a legend before he meets up with Luke and the Resistance? Or is he just some like random smuggler that other smugglers happen to know? Yeah, I think he's just a smuggler. Right. I would say if Nomad is doing what you're talking about, he would fit but, more of like the Han Solo just being like a smuggler. And, but like, if Han Solo had magic... That's what I'm saying is like, he has magic. He has a Dawn Shard. He has wells of power so far beyond everyone else that it almost like forces him to be involved in situations is what my guess is. I mean, I think he is purposefully trying to hide and therefore probably so bad at it, like not trying to make a spectacle. But he, I think he is the fact that you're called the legend. Well, at least Ox is calling him a legend and like the stories he leaves behind legends. I don't tell legends about like random thieves or, you know, people hiding effectively. Um, Aladdin, hello. <laughs> Rude. Why does he become a legend? Because he meets a genie because and elevates he's one his jump station. ahead of <laughs> <laughs> As soon as someone sings a Disney musical about you, you are a legend. You've elevated to legend status. One jump ahead of the lawman, one swing ahead of the sword. I steal only what I can afford. And, and that's, that's everything. everything. Okay. So he's been traveling. He's been skipping. How has he changed in all of this time? What is really indicative of the switch of Zigzal to Nomad? We see his personality very different, in my opinion, from when we last see him i feel when we first drop into the story he is barely recognizable as the sigzel that we see in the stormlight archive and he speaks directly to this quote in his youth nomad had been far too serious and rarely allowed himself levity end quote and we do see him a little bit looser definitely more active than we have seen him previously yeah even his times in extreme stress like when he's originally captured by the cinder king he's kind of like throwing out jokes he's got like a little bit of like a spider-man-esque vibe just quick witticisms just like tossed out Hoyt has definitely rubbed off on him and probably some of those bridge four fellas maybe mainly Hoyt. yeah probably Hoyt. (laughs) he also says that he misses rashar but he can never return and that's because he's afraid of leading the night brigade to his loved ones on rashar but of course he's still connected to that person that he was but even how it's expressing itself is different he says this quote thinking methodically logically That part of him remained, the part that had pushed for evidence and statistics even when his friends had laughed. He was still the same person all these years later, just as a hunk of metal was technically the same substance after being forged into an axe. End quote. So he's gained new skills and he has gained new traits out of necessity, out of the the reality that is now his life. But that core of him that we see in the Stormlight Archive, that logical, thoughtful, scholarly person still exists underneath all of those layers. And we start to see that come to the surface more throughout the story of the Sunlit Man as he kind of reconnects with 
who he really is underneath all of the running and fleeing and stress. Yeah, and the concept of taking your metal and forging it into a weapon as a description of what had happened to him is, to me, really a fascinating way of looking at it. Because I had seen Zigzal as kind of like that man with the spreadsheet, like really totally. loved Excel yeah. and yeah. just like counting up everything. Just like, we did four bridge runs today. And that means <laughs> that blah, 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 blah. But taking that as the hunk of iron and forging it into a weapon is almost terrifying. Like if you had someone who knew Excel really well, but then was using it weaponized we in a weaponized. Yes, exactly. I'm scared of weaponized spreadsheets. That seems like a great way to become like a Thanos level villain in the true utilitarianism mindset of just like. I'm going to be doing this thing because I have calculated, I have logically processed mm. that this is the best route forward, even mm -hmm. if that means X number of people need to die over here. Yeah, and I think that may contribute to uh, where we see him kind of at the beginning and we see Ox sort of coaching him into being more personable and maybe a little bit less practical and utilitarian, as you're saying. I think he's kind of had to be that way for a long time for his survival. But I like this imagery of the metal being just forged into something different. It's the same metal, the same substance in a different shape. And this speaks to the conversation between Nomad and Ox that we talked about in our last episode about how change is so important and that you're not becoming a different person. You are the same person, just different. Why I like it as well is that even though you can take a hunk of iron and make an iron weapon with it, you can also take a hunk of iron and through a process, through methodically heating and removing the impurities, you can take a hunk of iron and turn that into steel. You can actually change the type of metal mm. into something else by understanding the process and like moving it forward in a specific way. Well, that doesn't really go along with the... <laughs> no, I think it does. I think that's what? what we are witnessing here is that, yes, he is connected to that source, that original hunk of metal. But when he is finally a new person... He's not that same hunk of metal. He's no longer Zigzal. He's no longer Nomad. He's Zellian by the end of this all. And that would be like steel. His weapon has been purified even further. So there's like many different layers of how this metaphor kind of fits his situation. All right. Yeah, we're going we're going deep into the metaphors today. Oh, this is poetry. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> we also hear that Nomad accepts the idea of a god beyond. I found that fascinating. He obviously knows that Adonalsium is shattered, mm -hmm. but he still believes in this idea of there being a greater god. And so this to me has implications for like, is there a spiritual power that is above Adonalsium that is greater than Adonalsium? Is maybe that why Adonalsium was shattered? Was Adonalsium just held by another human being and was not the actual like capital G God, big spiritual power of the universe. These are the big questions of the Cosmere. We have nothing but speculation, but I think it's important when a character who is so connected, as Hoyd tells us, is so well-traveled and has so much innate knowledge because he's holding a Dawn shard and experiential knowledge that he's jumping around we assume seeing multiple cultures, you know, learning about people and their beliefs. He's a little bit like Zazed was back in the day, just kind of like learning stories, obviously, with the similarity between the world singers and the world bringers on Skadriel and Rashar, respectively. But I think that when there is a person who has so much experience vocalizing a belief that maybe most of the people in the Cosmere don't have, they would almost always stop at just like their shard. Clearly, we see that yeah. on Rashar and every other planet that we have basically come across. There are very few people, maybe outside of like Twinsel and the other Aetherbound. I mean, we do hear, I would say maybe one person in every book says something about God Beyond. 
I would have to go through and each book, and yeah, like hard... yeah, pick them all out. But it's it, mentioned, like it, yeah, it's not rare in terms of what we read. That's still only whatever five people in the entire Cosmere, but <laughs> <laughs> right. But clearly, the idea is sort of underground like spreading and i would say this kind of elevates it in my mind because of who is the speaker yeah and what he knows another quote from nomad about his relationship with deities someone says to him quote ad or whatever god you follow bless your flight sunlit i'll settle he said for no gods intentionally thwarting me for once end quote so at least one, maybe multiple shards, I'm assuming, have tried to interfere with him. I would assume at least one of them is Odium. That makes a lot of sense. Obviously, we could say autonomy. There mm, seems yeah. that the Night Brigade might be an extension of autonomy in some way, at least my vibe. You know, they just got a kind of like a... I mean, they're Threnodites. I know, but Threnody... Just because you're a Threnodite doesn't mean that you're not touched by autonomy yeah. or like influenced by him. I think it points to, again, more appreciation for this concept of a god beyond because really all that we have seen or experienced of death in the Cosmere is Kelsier's death in secret history, which is yeah. not... Well, we see, don't we see Vin like pass through? We see Vin, we yeah. see the Lord Ruler, and then we see Kelsier like refusing that right. aspect. But the passage is always to what we've assumed is the, the spiritual beyond. realm. Yeah the, yeah, the beyond. And you are kind of moving from your physical body dies, mm -hmm. your cognitive shadow, your cognitive mind dies. It returns the energy investiture to the spiritual realm. Yeah, but then maybe... maybe there's something beyond that even. Well... Or maybe the concept of God beyond is just the very human way of anthropomorphizing everything and like making it a person because a God beyond is much easier for us to comprehend than like an endless well of spiritual power where you will be. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's know? kind of like a ohm in Indian belief systems, right? You have this concept, not of a person, not of a deity, because they have many deities, but they have the, like the three main deities in yeah, Hinduism. But then there's like the just underlying spiritual power. Exactly. And yeah. that's you know, vocalized as Ohm, but I think that's kind of a great concept that we could link on to is that what I believe this to be is maybe something more like that. That's what Nomad believes mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. He believes in the Force uh, from yeah, the Star yeah, Wars yeah, yeah. universe instead of a specific god. He mainly just wants the gods to stop bothering him, <laughs> yeah. which to me sounds a lot like the Greek gods who are constantly just like meddling yeah. in human affairs. I, I mean, mean like, I think the here. shards are kind of like that. Some are obviously more hands-on than others, but because they're these powers are all being held by people who are previously mortals... <laughs> Mm -hmm. They have all of the mortal failings. Yes, even more so than some of the Greek gods in that respect, who are <laughs> yeah. at least... To be fair, at least so far as we've seen, the shards aren't coming down to uh, assault people, particularly women. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot uh, more what we could see in the court of the gods with the returned, who are like directly involved in human relationships and like yeah. you know forming a society around them that's like the most greek god on display yeah. in the cosmere the shards are a step removed from that maybe like the the fathers and mothers of that greek gods mm. that are so famous yeah like chronos and chronos gaia, gaia exactly yeah. yeah the kind of the forces of nature but then we have the Dawn Shards as well, which are, you know, seemingly just mixing up. So we can't say, oh, it's exactly like the Greek gods or exactly like yeah. the Hindu belief system because it's the Cosmere belief system. Yeah. <laughs> Join the church, kids. We are ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Nomad's spren during this time, Auxiliary, and get a little bit more information about who he is, what he is like. Yeah, Ox is a near-dead spread from the events that we talked about. 
taking on the Don Shard and that relationship lasting for several decades before in a moment of panic or need calling upon the Don Shard, which then sucks Auxiliary's soul and investiture almost, I was going to say to the bone, but he probably never had bones in the yeah. first place, almost down to his core self. And it leaves him completely monotone, completely without, I'm not going to say without personality, but without inflection. Yes. Yeah. That's a great distinction. He does have a personality, mm -hmm. but in terms of his voice, he is a neutral Janet, which is why Excellent. he has developed this idiosyncratic way of speaking where he uh, narrates his emotions or his intention with things like he said lightheartedly or whatever. Yes, really kind of like spelling out exactly how he's feeling because he yeah. no longer can express that feeling. But the idea that he's taking the time to say those words in that order, to tell little jokes, to call Nomad his valet, all of those things let us know that he still has a personality yeah. and it can only like be expressed this way. Yeah. Nomad also has to speak out loud to Auxiliary, but Auxiliary speaks in Nomad's mind only. And I found this interesting. I don't know if we have seen other Radiants speak like only in their minds to their spren or if they're always speaking out loud. The great part about a novel is that difference when it comes to something like film is every word every phrase doesn't need to be spoken out loud a character doesn't need to say everything they can have a conversation in their entire head the reader can play along with that or follow along with that and so i don't know because it can seamlessly transition between this is happening in your head this conversation is happening in your head or this conversation is happening out loud. And from my perspective as a reader, those are identical things. Like it doesn't yeah. really matter. Yeah. But in this instance, the distinction is noted and it is different from what we've seen from like Syl, who clearly can communicate with other people as she right. sees fit. Yeah, she definitely speaks out loud and can determine who hears her or not. Uh, there are a few times, I think, when Syl and Kaladin communicate mm -hmm. without speaking out loud. Sometimes that's words, usually just small words like Kaladin or whatever. A vague feeling. Yeah, more but than a, yeah, a lot of times it's more of just a feeling, which is also a way that Nomad and Ox communicate when Nomad is not able to breathe. When he has to hold his breath, he's able to send feeling sensations and intentions to Ox non-verbally this does reinforce the idea though of the valet in that ox probably doesn't and can't exist outside right. of nomad yes exactly he is trapped so to speak or like bonded so permanently the only thing that's left is that piece of ox that was deeply connected to nomad yeah but the part that was outside of nomad separate from nomad was probably washed away or taken away by the dawn shard and they have a pretty robust relationship this is the most experienced radiant that i think we've seen up to this point yeah and nomad is able to summon ox as many different types of tools which we've not seen anyone else do with such frequency or such ease we've kind of only started to see uh kaladin be able to manifest sill as different things and nomad is just throwing all kinds of things out there gotta get really creative since he can't use most weapons yes yeah, so he certainly has the ability to like expand uh functional shield much larger than would needed to be to cover a person but he also is creating complex objects he's creating a yeah. ball and chain a and like a chain and hook situation yeah there's one even when it's described i forgot what's like in his hands but he is described in, as holding it in both hands and it's connected down his arm around his back and then over to his other hand because ox needs to be connected All he can't piece. like yeah. split himself into two but nomad wanted him into so it was like two different hooks i believe so he could like grab onto something 
and he had those in both of his hands. But then if you could see under his clothes, it would be like this little line that traveled up and around his body and over to his other hand so that it was one piece. And this type of complexity reminds me a lot of Twin Soul and his mm, manipulation of mm-hmm. Aethers, which is far more fine and refined than we've seen from Radiance. But I think, you know, arguably the power sources are just being manipulated, they should be able to kind of do similar things. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a difference because Ox has a limit to how big of an object he can make. Whereas I think with Aethers, if you have enough investiture, you basically have no limit (laughs) to what you can make. But another thing that was really cool is that Nomad is also able to change Ox's shape like in the moment where he can uh, close and open the hook or like yeah, a mechanical. link in a chain or something like that. Which kind of reminds me again of awakening objects, which is like grab on yeah. touch or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, he's kind of using commands. commands. Yes. And so this concept of is he doing that because he has a learned like Uncle Iroh to just like take in lessons from all the different magic systems. I think or, he's just a really experienced Radiance. Exactly. Or yeah. is this something that we should expect all Radiance to be able to do yeah. with enough practice? And it gets back to Dalinar's original question when he's digging in shard plate. Mm-hmm. Like, why are there no shard shovels? Yeah. Why was war the only aspect that these things are allowed to take? And the answer, of course, is they're not. They they yeah. were never limited in that way because they were living things that are now dead by the time Dalinar gets them. Yeah, and they are, you know, spren are potential, mm-hmm. basically. And so you can use their identity as a potential thing to create whatever you want. I love the creativity on display from Ox and Nomad. We see a bunch of transition and changes and uses of Ox and what we are really left to kind of ponder about their relationship is if this is where it's at now, what was it like the day before Ox died, the day before he was sucked up by the Dawn Shard? Was this ability, you know, tenfold or was it Mm. the downside that forced Nomad to become more creative. I'm kind of like wondering, like, did he only yeah, whip out question. the shard blade because everyone would be like, oh my God, shard blade, so yeah. scary. And it was the creativity like coming as a byproduct of his restrictions, his torment. Yeah. Okay. This is a really interesting conversation that's going to tie into a conversation we're going to have later on down the line that I'm excited to get to. Sets the stage for us to meet up with nomad as he lands on canticle and all of the things that we learn from that point on if that's the case then let's talk about a dawn shard let's talk about torment let's see what we saw in the sunlit man see what we saw Mm -hmm. yes we see the actual mechanism for this prohibition on hurting people that we see so often with hoid that we've talked about so much with hoid nomad experiences his muscles locking up if he has any intention to hurt someone or to use a weapon. Yeah, there's the very common flight or fight response. But another one of those Fs that can be worked in there is the freeze response. Yes. Which is very normal among humans, seen humorously among animals, maybe you've seen some goats yeah, just yeah. <laughs> completely freeze and fall over when they are defensive. Or any type of play dead response. Play is, dead, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, is the freeze. Coming through. And that's kind of what we see with Nomad, kind of forced to freeze. And so much of what he would have been trained in Bridge 4 is like action, movement. Think of all yeah. the times Kaladin talks about needing to move and just like his stormlight forcing him to and this is exactly the thing that is restricted when it comes to this torment from the dawn shard we hear that the torment has grown strong enough to deny nomad weapons including the ability to summon ox as a shard blade or anything else that the torment might see as a weapon so it seems that 
at least that aspect is something that has developed over time, that at some point the torment was weaker and Nomad was able to at least manifest a weapon. Maybe he wouldn't be able to use it on someone, but he could at least manifest Ox as a weapon. And the restrictions have grown tighter and tighter as time has passed. That scar tissue on his soul that he describes getting thicker and thicker. Yeah, the question of why is central to the experience of Nomad becoming Zellion by the end. And we see times, even times early, when he is able to summon the full shard blade right at the beginning of the book, in chapter four or something like that, when he is imprisoned by the Cinder King he is able to summon the shard blade, throw it, and it like sticks into the wall and Mm. everyone in the crowd goes silent. Mm -hmm. And the Cinder King then like turns his focus more permanently onto Nomad. And that's like when it becomes his defining mission to like hunt him down. But I think that this juxtaposition that we're seeing of the torment has seemingly gotten strong enough to prevent weapons unless there is a return to what nomad used to be maybe but by the end it's he becomes someone entirely new and is able to summon his weapon yeah well he also is able to connect to the planet and siphon off some of that corruption which is really important to the journey of elegy and kind of like learning to siphon off the corruption and he kind of uses that for himself as well yeah yeah so i'm curious how much of his abilities towards the end of the book are a result of him becoming a new version of himself Mm -hmm. and how much of it is really just a mechanical side effect of the fact that he's able to siphon off the corruption i would guess and this is my speculation only but that the siphoning off allowed him the option to go down a different path and become Maybe. a different person. Not that it's only a result of siphoning off, like returning to him to the state that he used to be. Yeah. I think that we also get some hints directly from Ox about what is going on and why this is the case. But before we get there, I want to hit on what Hoyt has to say about the torment because he calls it a blessing. Could you read this with me? Quote, so it's a blessing, Nomad asked, gesturing to himself, this torment you've given me? Every torment is, Wit said, even mine, end quote. Now, is he saying even my torment that I got from the Dawn Shard, like the one you have? Yes. Or is he talking about a new torment? No. Okay. 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 He definitely has a similar restriction on harming things. Yeah, and Sigzel got the Dawn Shard from Hoyd. Like, they've held the same Dawn Shard and they have the same torment. Absolutely. Yeah. But Hoyd has stacked on so many things. He might be picking up... I'm questioning, like, where does the torment come from? Are other things carrying around torments as well? Oh, I mean, maybe, but I think in this circumstance, we're just talking about the Dawn Shard. I think at minimum, we are talking about just the Dawn Shard. And there may be something else that Hoyd is talking about as well. I don't think so. If there are many superpowered items like the Dawn Shard... Are there? Well, there's like... There's four Dawn Shards. There's four Dawn Shards, yes. But we see this kind of like blessing and a curse also apparent with the Night Watcher and Cultivation's general attitude to like gift giving is gift giving with a curse or, you know, kind of like a pro and con I think that's more of of a Night Watcher thing than a cultivation thing. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if that is present in a lot of these highly invested beans or items, you know, kind of a a pro and con that like comes with some of that much. Yeah. I think that's an underlying principle of investiture. Basically, we obviously have and positive versions of investiture that can generate more power than they use. Mm -hmm. But, and I think Brandon has talked about this quite a bit of trying to work in downsides and side effects and counter uh, balances to power so that basically every type of magic, every type of power that appears in the Cosmere always has something on the other side how big that thing is you know depends sometimes it's negligible sometimes it's a torment 
Yeah, I think in this case, it's a little bit like atomic energy where you can split the atom, create brilliant weapons or great power sources, but there's radiation as a side mm. effect. And that's kind of like the torment. Like you have to deal with yeah. this, whether you're using the power for good or evil, the torment that comes with it, the radiation that comes yeah. with it is a little bit what it seems is happening to Nomad because he is like corrupted over time by this experience that he's having. Yeah, I like that metaphor. Some of the additional effects on Nomad's body that we hear about from this experience is that, quote, his body, as always, eventually adapted to match how he looked when he first took the Dawn Shard all those years ago, end quote. So we see his hair, his facial hair, his body reverting to the same way that he was when he first took the Dawn Shard, which is quite fascinating. It's definitely reminiscent of The Return, which we mentioned earlier. Yeah. And the way that Zahel mentions that the manipulation of the body, his physical body, and the royal locks are all kind of entwined in being a return. But they have a choice in how they appear. And to me, it sounds like Nomad, let's say he shaved his head and got a tattoo because that's how he wanted to look. His body would automatically regrow his hair and erase the tattoo until he looked exactly the way he did when he took the Dawn Shard. And Nomad does not have control over that. Yes, where we think that a similar thing is happening with Kaladin, right? When he tries to get the tattoo of Bridge 4, it's always washing off, oh. basically, because he I doesn't mean, that's see a himself. Different thing, I think. But I think it comes down to the same concept of like, how do you see yourself? How is your spiritual DNA imprinted oh. on you? And that at that time, Kaladin didn't see himself a certain way. On the other side of the Cosmere, we have Kelsey or Thydekar with the scars forever present. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think in this a instance- question, if this is because of Nomad's self-perception or if it's just a Dawn Chart thing. Well, I think it is his self-perception is now not comparable to the weight of power that the Dawn Shard had. So basically, it's the Dawn mm. Shard's perception of Nomad oh, is the same as when yeah, they met. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's That's like, funny. you need to be exactly what I always remembered you to be <laughs> yeah. because that is what is imprinted on the Dawn Shard. Mm. And seemingly, Nomad is able to change. He, he changes his spiritual web in this story. He yeah. becomes a new person. But there are maybe limits because of the Dawn Shard. I think that he might be able to like change more and hmm. experience more variation if he wasn't bound up in this Dawn Shard and Torment situation. Yeah, because he still has like some type of lingering connection to the Dawn Shard, which is why all of this is still happening. So I would guess that when he's able to sever that final connection, he will be able to change physically. I'd agree. Let's talk about some of the other effects, abilities, or you know, bonuses that he <laughs> has because he can't get drunk or it takes a lot to get him to intoxication. Yeah, kind of similar to Stormlight. It seems like he probably has a really quick rate of healing. And then we also hear that he has some immortality. Obviously, he's been alive for probably a couple hundred years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but he does draw a line here between himself and Hoyd saying, quote, his master who had held the Dawn Shard for far longer could never die. Nomad was far from that level, end quote. It is interesting because you, you kind of can go down the speculative rabbit hole that, you know, people do with comic book heroes all the time. You know, what would it take to kill Wolverine, mm, yeah. the person who can constantly regenerate and... If you chopped off his head and buried it, what would happen? Would he grow a new body from his head? Would he grow a new head from his body? Would there be two Wolverines? What is going on? How much damage could Nomad theoretically take and mm. survive? The clear thing that we see on display in The Sunlit Man is that either by choice or by design of the Dawn Shard, Nomad and Ox have developed this communication system for describing his amount of investiture. Mm -hmm. And it's broken down along the lines of BEUs, 
breath equivalent units. And when I saw that the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, this is important as a marker of where they're at in the Cosmere. The percentages that he's constantly playing around with are very low in the story. He's talking about needing a 5% minimum to maintain his background healing. He's talking about needing a 10% minimum to have what would be considered like full control or full abilities, at least the ones that aren't restricted by the Dawn Shard. And then, of course, needing far more than that to actually skip away from a planet. And when we're looking at kind of the development of these superpowers and how they are used, maybe not linked to specific individuals, but just kind of like the commodification of powers like we've talked about from Scadrial, I think BEUs is going to become a huge important aspect of Fabrials and the blending into technology that we see going forward. How many BEUs does it take to fly a spaceship? Or how much BEUs does it take to move through an oath gate? Like right now, it's just defined as a bunch of gems and a bunch of stormlight is required. But I would imagine eventually those types of things will all be broken down into a breath equivalent unit. Which is something that Sigzel actually is trying to work on in the Stormlight Archive. He's the only person that's like, how can we measure exactly how much stormlight is in a sphere? And then like how many spheres go into doing this particular thing? And we see a whole lot of different investiture things that are going to be in our investiture episode. In this episode, we're still talking about Nomad's powers. Yes, we are. Because he is even able to survive shard blade wounds, though he says they are, quote, storming tough to heal. We've seen other characters survive or heal from shard blade wounds. So that's not that surprising to me. Yeah. But again, I think the the scale level is probably a lot different for someone like Nomad. He might be able to take legitimately multiple blows from shard blades and still heal out of it if he has enough investiture. Or just heal much quicker. Exactly, comparatively. Yeah. Okay, along with these sort of primarily negative effects of the Dawn Shard, he also gains some cool abilities, which he even mentions at one point he gets some boons from this experience and like he doesn't want the torment to be completely gone. He specifically does not siphon away all of the corruption or the scar tissue For example, as long as he maintains, as you were saying, those certain levels of investiture, he has innate sort of exceptional uh, abilities that he's able to use little bits of investiture to, you know, be faster, be stronger, heal quicker uh, that he's able to do as long as he's got that buffer of investiture. Yeah. In the comic book universe, there's normally a discussion about how all humans in the DC and Marvel universe are simply stronger, faster, more durable than humans here on Earth, that it's just like everybody gets bumped up. And in this case, his bare minimum threshold just kind of like bumps him up, I think, across the board. You know, if he was a level 70 before, once he has the Dawn Shard entwined in his soul, he's just permanently moved up to level 80. And then everything is then fluctuating off of that or above that level. He also is similar to another character that we know and love in that he now has the ability to metabolize nearly any kind of investiture. You are, of course, referring to Lyft, I believe. Yes. Yes, I am. This, to me, jumped out in a big way because we had talked about Lyft's game-breaking potential, along with Renarn back in an older episode. But one of the unique aspects that Cultivation gave to Lyft, and we should assume Cultivation gave it to Lyft for a Mm. reason, is this ability to metabolize food into Stormlight or Lifelight. I want to say it's Lifelight. She can absorb Stormlight as well, though. Her ability to metabolize food leads to Lifelight is what we think is going on, right? It's what I think is going on. The fact that Nomad has a similar ability, or I don't even know if it's necessarily similar, because it's not about metabolizing food to become investiture. It's about being able to take any investiture in. Yeah. But clearly there's some link 
The word metabolize obviously just always makes me think of lift. And that is a direct quote from the text. So there's something different going on with Nomad than there would be if he was just a standard radiant. Definitely. He does say that this metabolization requires a power source of potential investiture and not kinetic investiture. So this is the same as uh, surge binding. You're able to take in stormlight from a sphere, but you're not able to like absorb the investiture from a light weaving. Yes. And for those who want like a more simple understanding, I would just go with kinetic energy means moving. If something is moving like photons from the sun, like Taldane's sun, you know, is moving around a blast from an energy weapon, that's all kinetic and like movement that cannot be absorbed. Whereas the potential energy, I think he uses the concept of a battery. He's great yeah. at tapping batteries yeah. and little stormlight gems can just be considered little batteries to him. Basically. I would also assume that how we see the radiance each time they level up, they also become more efficient users of Stormlight. Yes. I would consider Nomad to be the Hyper most- efficient. Yes, yeah. the most efficient maybe that we've seen across the Cosmere in that a little bit of investiture of any source, well, not any source, because they do specifically note how across the Cosmere, there's more like energy potential in different sources of investiture. But basically, when you calculate it down to BEU, I think he would be better at using one BEU than anyone else in the Cosmere, maybe outside of Hoyt or other, you know, shard characters. But he's basically, in my mind, very efficient. He also says that he is able to get investiture from another living being. It does require, quote, very unique circumstances, end quote. But it's possible. I don't know if that just means, for example, being able to absorb breath with the incantation that is sort of normal, or if there are other examples of pulling investiture out of another living being in some way, but it's specifically mentioned. Yeah, I would say that it's more akin to pulling out the innate investiture in every person rather than extra breaths that a person might have. So it would be the way that the threnodites on Canticle are able to share heat back and forth. That's kind of what I imagine is they're like doing in practicality what yeah. Nomad is talking about being able to do in a specific yeah. circumstance. Well, and yeah, and he talks about how unique it is that they are able to do this so easily on Canticle. Right. It would yeah. be like something he thought only he could do or other people like him could or do. Or re just required much more hoopla than what it does for the Threnodites. To go back quickly to this idea of metabolizing investiture, investiture can sustain Nomad, meaning he doesn't need to eat for a certain amount of time if he has X amount of investiture. It does deplete his investiture stores, but it's almost like the way that we can store fat and then burn the fat at a later date to use as energy, he can do that with investiture. So it's almost the inverse of Lyft, where Lyft has to eat physical food in order to create investiture. Nomad can take in investiture to replace food. Which I always imagined was something that Lyft could do because it seems like if you can walk down the street one way you can turn no, around and walk the other way. she's always talking about how she's starving. Right. I think that again clearly on display uh -oh. we don't see Lyft doing yeah, yeah. this and her understanding of her power is I need to eat food to get investiture. In my mind though I think that it should be possible and maybe Nomad is the full expression of mm. this ability. It's I just don't so, think so. It's such a limiting factor in many ways until you reverse it, until it becomes investiture can sustain you in a permanent aspect or, you know, more permanent aspect. That's when I think there's a lot more to play around with. Right mm. now, it seems like a, a torment or a, a curse for Lyft. For Lyft, yeah. Oh. Because she's constantly just needing to eat on a world where Stormlight is literally circling the planet like every couple of Until days. Until all of the stormlight gets corrupted and you can't take any 
external stormlight in without becoming corrupted and the lift is able to make her own pure investiture with her body i mean that's pretty cool too yeah but it uh, that sounds like something I'm that nomad would be able lift to do is a game breaker that's the game breaking aspect like something like that is going to happen and lift is going to be the only one you know who can do xyz thing because she's lift but that's a whole other conversation <laughs> I like to lead you down the path and just taking you away <laughs> yeah. from the beautiful notes that you've taken. I know, this let's, is an episode of tangents, but it's okay. They're all good. Let's go back to a quote about the feeling of having this much power. Quote, a human body crammed with that much power would be electric with the need to move, to act. One would feel a virtually irresistible urge to use the power, to satisfy its demand, to become kinetic. In his case, it drove him to constant motion, to avoid sleep, to push himself to keep running. End quote. This is a side effect of the Dawn Shard, but also any source of investiture, as we mentioned, definitely something the Windrunners are constantly yeah. talking about. Yeah, we see it happen a lot with any surge binder kind of feeling this need to move and that only intensifies as the amount of investiture in your body increases. So we see this with Nomad, obviously, and then also with Elegy. Speaking of the way that Nomad is able to use or take in investiture, there's a moment that I'm curious for your thoughts on. There's a moment where Nomad makes ox into a staff and then he embeds the off-worlder's sun heart into it and he has previous to this siphoned off the torments like corruption from his soul he sticks it in the staff and then quote i can feel the power of that sun heart growing the knight says i i might be able to draw upon the investiture you are putting into it why i can't use the power of the canker on your soul Filtered and purified, maybe, he said, raising his staff. Not really the time to ponder. This will give you a few hundred BEUs. Use them well, end quote. So it almost seems like Ox is able to absorb the investiture, like, separately from Nomad, and then Nomad is able to use that investiture? Yeah, I think what we have on display, and clearly not something Brandon wanted to dive into because yeah, yeah, Nomad yeah. tells us, don't think about that right now. <laughs> yeah. We're too busy running. <laughs> but I think what we have on display may be something akin to compounding on Scadrial, where mm. there is an ability to use two different powers, Alamancy and Furukami, to magnify the other. Hmm. And maybe that's what's going on here is that seemingly there is investiture going into the staff or going into the, the sun heart, right? Yeah. And then Ox is able to use that, draw upon that when he wouldn't normally be able to draw investiture in. Yeah. That to me kind of sounds similar to unlocking extra potential from your compounding kind of yeah i'm curious what the mechanism is behind this because it's not like sill can ab absorb investiture on her own and then kaladin can like draw on her store of investiture you know it's definitely a one-way thing where kaladin takes investiture in and then because of his bond with sill he's able to do cool stuff yeah and it might be because of the nature of a sun heart like that could be the mechanism that is different it's kind of presented the same as a stormlight gem yeah. but maybe it's not because it's like part of a body or part of someone's soul like maybe it has well, something nomad different. does draw investiture out of the sun heart definitely yeah so he's able to do that we kind so of think it's like, like a gem an extra power that ox has right and so that's what i'm saying is maybe because it's not a gem it's not just a rock that's filled with investiture it is a piece of someone's soul and mm. ox is a piece right. of adenalsium soul or a piece of you know the right universe. part of his function is to like attach to a spirit web kind of yeah, yeah. and so maybe that is the dividing line like what makes this different is the fact that the sun heart is not a gem heart 
Maybe. Listeners, if you like to get into the weeds about things like this, let us know what you think is happening here. But speaking of the bond between Nomad and Ox, let's talk a little bit more about Nomad's identity as a Night Radiant. There's a lot of really good and interesting quotes about his relationship to that part of himself, that part of his past, how it has changed and how it's continuing to change. Yeah, he says this in a moment of panic, quote, I thought Nomad shouted that my oaths overrode that aspect of the torment. I'm sorry, Nomad, but what oaths? End quote. Yeah, there's a couple of times when Ox is questioning, maybe even throwing some shade over at Nomad, but this is the first introduction of the two oaths that Nomad has oh. sworn, but also maybe hinting at the oaths that he broke and that he like walked yeah. away from. Yeah, my interpretation was that Ox is throwing shade at the fact that Nomad has abandoned his oaths, not necessarily like choosing between oaths, but just like, yeah, you don't have any oaths anymore, bud. You walked away from them. Why would they help you now? That's my first reading yeah. of it. But now looking at it, I know that there are two oaths that he swore, two series of oaths that mm -hmm. he swore for his different radiant and maybe three. Maybe the Don Shard comes with oaths as <laughs> maybe. well. Maybe. The actions that we have on display are reminiscent to me of when Kaladin swore conflicting oaths that he was tasked with doing one thing, he swore to do another. Those can't exist simultaneously and leads to his corruption or his weakness with yeah. the bond that he has with Syl. So there is some aspect of this where previously when no man was following his oaths it was kind of counteracting the power of the torment mm -hmm. and then at some point he abandoned his oaths and there's a lot of conversation about how perhaps if Nomad goes back to his oaths, he will uh, gain more power or have more ability to counteract the torment. However, during the that. climax of the book, yeah, he tries to say his oaths again. Nothing happens. And Ox is surprised. He thought that that is what was going to work. And then they have this well, they try to have a conversation about why Nomad walked away from his oaths. And Nomad says that he doesn't know. He says, quote, humans, Nomad whispered, are inconsistent sometimes. We do what we feel. We can't explain it. I look back on the choice I made and it feels entirely unlike me. But I did it. I made the choice in the heat of a moment, end quote. And I think this storytelling decision is really interesting and refreshing to have a character either truly just not know or at least like not identify with a specific reason for making maybe a bad choice in the past. I certainly think it's interesting. It also leads me to a very similar conversation we see a lot in the Stormlight Archive and that we've had a lot about trauma and how you deal with that trauma, how you process that trauma. So many of our characters in the Stormlight Archive are dealing in a direct way with trauma. Kaladin, why are sure. you refusing to go out and hang out with people? Well, because I'm afraid that I'm going to lose you because I've lost everyone and everyone always dies around me because I'm cursed and I'm Kaladin. That kind of like makes sense. It's a very direct way. But what Nomad is expressing here is I don't even know who that person was. They they don't mm -hmm. even seem like me. Maybe the traumas that he has dealt with and part of that logical, methodical personality that he was developed. If you can't explain every single step in the path, you kind of just like break cognitively or or break away a piece of yourself cognitively and it does become a, a different version of you but so much a different version that it's almost like a different person entirely and that's way more complicated than mm -hmm. other things that we have seen or kind of like talked about i love the idea that he has no real concept yeah. of why he did what yeah. he did and there's no so there's no like justification mm -hmm. for it there's no like well at the time i was feeling xyz thing or well it's because of the trauma that i went through it's really just like i don't know man sometimes we just do stuff 
because we feel like something and we do things that have no reason and sometimes they suck. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Which is true. Like I think that's such a um a unique human thing and it's refreshing to see it written in this way. Yeah, I certainly think that there are maybe aspects of, you know, our own personal culture without any magic attached to it, but a lot of uh, relationships, either from one side or from both sides, it's just kind of like, why did you do that thing? I don't I don't know. I don't have a a good explanation yeah. or a good clear series of events that was leading to me to make that decision yeah. versus another one. I just kind of like did it. Or and also like maybe there were reasons, you know, deep down like mm -hmm. sure maybe this is attached to some kind of trauma and then I'm processing it and I'm doing it in this specific way that blah 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 blah. But at some point it's kind of like does it matter? Yeah, I don't know if it you does. You know, like does it matter? I don't know. It happened. I felt a certain way I did a thing that's what happened and now we're just dealing with the ramifications of that yeah it kind of brings me to philosophical questions regarding free will and like do people have free will Sam Harris uh, author has talked a lot about this in detail and kind of like bringing in all of the studies but the the most simple explanation is that there are viewable neurons that are firing within your brain moments before a decision is made, but you have no control over those neurons firing. But from everything that we know as humans, the neurons firing are why you made the decision, but you can't control which neurons are firing and why they're firing. So do you have free will or is it a like infinitely long spectrum of all the different ways that matter has collected over time to lead to this moment when your neurons are firing in a specific way that is not really explainable. And we write stories about the yeah, journey that we've been on. All of on. the things. And I think this is also indicative of how lost and disconnected mm -hmm. Nomad feels. He says, quote, the journey was supposed to be the important part, wasn't it? Why then was he so miserable? He had no answers. He didn't know his destination. Maybe that's why he was so lost. It's hard to be anything else if you didn't know where you were going, end quote. So back to this idea that both sides of that first oath are really important. You can't value the journey if you don't even know where you're going and you're, the journey is just aimless wandering with no reason. Yeah, which is similar to the line he says to Wit about the destination being important. You can't yes. just ignore the destination yeah. entirely. It's journey before destination, not journey only. Yeah, journey without <laughs> destination yeah. is not how the line goes. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about some of the coolest visual aspects from The Sunlit Man because when Nomad is reforming his shard plate, we also can kind of see it as the forming of Zellion, the, the yeah. change from Nomad to Zellion kind of represented on the page. Quote, he trailed off as he saw it in the air beside him, a small fracture, a misalignment like how a broken mirror might reflect a disjointed image. It floated beside his head the size of a fingernail. There was something familiar about it. It's one of my fragments, he whispered. A piece of my armor. You said those were dead. I thought they were gone. Consumed. End, End quote. quote. Yes, the fragments that he's describing are, are the bits of his armor, which we now know because of Kaladin and the fourth level ideals that we've seen in the Stormlight Archive. We know that that relationship with those spren that make up the armor is significant and meaningful similar to the relationship with their main spren it's not the same yeah. but it's also not nothing and the armor we would assume the longer you're spending with those spren the more that relationship develops i would think it's akin to something like having a pet instead of having yeah. a lover yeah 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 i think that's a good comparison i liked this description but it almost reminds me of a different radiant order spren and i'm not going to remember which one it is now but there's a different spren that's described as looking like a mirror well are we thinking that it's the high spren well, not no. the high spren, the high spren subclass 
for the Skybreakers. Yeah, I don't know if we know what that is. Okay. My, that's my guess here because it doesn't necessarily sound like a windspren, which would be the yeah. subclass of the wind runners. Right. So uh, my assumption is this is the spren that makes his armor from the skybreakers. Let us know if you happen to remember what that spren type is. And also, let's go to another quote. We have this quote: "Zellian turned back to Jeffrey. Jeffrey dazed on the deck." The bearded man looked up, eyes wide, trembling. Why, he said, why is the light breaking around you? Zellian glanced to the side. More fragments hung in the air around him in an arch. Three others glowed on his arms, remnants of a different kind of spren. All were reflections of light in the air, making it seem distorted. Maybe ten of them, almost like old times. The remnants of two orders and the oaths he'd left behind. End quote. So this is the first confirmation that his armor is made up of two subclasses of Spren. Yeah. Now, I think from the description, they're all distorting the air a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the ones on his arm, I think, are the wind Spren. And then the ones around him in an arch Mm. are the other Spren. Again, like the Skybreaker subclass. Yeah, maybe. They're described slightly differently, so maybe that's the case. Pretty cool, though, to get that confirmation that his armor is part Windrunner and part Skybreaker. It's definitely the coolest of the armor types. Yeah. And then we also find out that his armor has space capabilities, like we saw in that excerpt of the Six of the Dusk sequel, quote, the suit of armor designed to maintain temperature and life support for the person it protected had been able to withstand even the sunlight's terrible heat, end quote. So it's got this built-in life support that I feel like we don't really see on Rashar. This seems to be kind of a new uh, or like space age Cosmere development. I would certainly say the people that we saw on Six of the Dust or in that excerpt are not Nomad. And so this is widespread in their use. My question, of course, is like, how far does this go? Are they in what we would consider like astronaut suits across all of space? Or do they just like jump from their main spaceship down to planets in a suit kind of like the the star trek universe a little bit more Mm -hmm. although sometimes they just have teleportation but like if they don't have teleportation they kind of do like dive bombs off their main ship i mean you would have to have a ridiculous amount of investiture to continue yes powering the suit if you were gonna fly through space single man yeah through this through space yes so either you're everybody's like a fifth or fourth ideal, Knight Radiant, you know, very efficient with their use of investiture. Or, yeah, it's just, it would be so intensive, the vacuum of space, all of that danger, radiation, you got to fight that off at all times. I think that, like, I think Shardplate could do it. It's just a question of how long it could do it. Maybe you can get from Rashar to Ashen or Braze, Mm -hmm. but I think anything longer than that is unlikely yes because you also have to have like a propulsion of some type you have to be moving forward at least Mm. you know you have to get up to some speed and can you still manipulate gravity in space that's an excellent (laughs) question i think the answer has to be yes because their ability to manipulate gravity isn't they're manipulating the planet's gravity it's more like they're changing their spiritual webs attention to gravity or like the way that gravity moves them. But I don't think they're like taking the planet's gravity and manipulating that or merging that in some way. I think Mm -hmm. it's entirely absent from the equation. And so I think they could be able to, if they can, and they know the direction, it would just be about do all of the lashings towards your target. And if you do a lot of math. You would have to be so good at math in order to do this. But if you could just... Maybe this is why Sigzel is so powerful. Yes, he's mathematics to He's like, more. I can do calculus in my head. You would have to. Uh, and then if anything goes wrong at all, you're totally screwed. But you, if you could lash yourself in one single direction, once you're in space, of course, there's nothing slowing you down. So you can just like mm. maintain, you know, half of light speed or whatever it happens to be and just fly towards the 
target that you have. But if you're off by even a small amount, and I I don't think that this is possible, but it, because if you're off by even a small amount, you're going to miss the planet by so much. <laughs> that it's, you'll just go through space forever and just be like, oh, man. I mean, Where eventually I? you'll hit something. No, that's not the way that space works. <laughs> you could go forever and never hit anything or be around anything. I guess the Cosmere is said to be in a dwarf galaxy, so maybe everything's a little bit more tightly packed in there. But no, I, th- I, th- I think that's a bad strategy. They should definitely have some type of ship instead. <laughs> okay, but Nomad's armor, when it is reborn after Ox's sacrifice, is even cooler. Quote, His armor was glowing, too, though not in either of its customary shades of blue. Instead, it glowed with the light of embers. The sunlight might have damaged it because little flecks of red-orange light continued to burn all across it. And when he moved, he trailed smoke, end quote. Such a cool image. My question is, does his armor now have Also, some of Canticle's investiture, because Zellion is spiritually capital C connected to the planet Canticle. And so this armor has Skybreaker investiture, Windrunner investiture, and Canticle investiture. It would be almost like there's three Spren that make up his armor now. Yeah, that's that's my little pet theory. No, that's wonderful. And I think that... There's something going on there because remember the way that it's described is not the power of the sun that is like actually right. going like doing all of the work here. There's some linking between the sun, the core of the planet, and then like an electrical current that is infusing people with investiture. And so I would think if there was going to be an electrical current, it would find its way to the thing that made the best link or the best connection is where that investiture path would want to travel. Mm, and, and the armor is like better at conducting the investiture. That's how yeah. I would see it is like the investiture of this planet would want to do that because it's always doing that with everybody's sun heart. It's doing that. But then in this instance, it would be like there was a beacon lit up that everything would want to move towards. Like a lightning rod. Yes. And so it, there's not spren there, but I could see it definitely being the case that, yeah, there is a investiture. And maybe it's just the investiture. Maybe the suit, instead of being powered by Stormlight, is simply powered by the yeah. investiture of Canticle. Yeah. And that's all that's going on. Yeah. So then question is, will the armor now always be like right, this? Is exactly. it going to carry with it this sunlit red-orange light along with its original lights? Or is this a only on Canticle thing? Well, we do have a couple of images. Now, we didn't know that these were images, but in the Kickstarter for the minifigs, I think that's what Legos are called, but in the miniatures, (laughs) there was a new character introduced. Many of the famous big characters, but then also the secret character of Zellion. At the time, there was a bunch of speculation across the community. We didn't know who it was. People were guessing Moash. People were guessing Evil Dalinar. People were, you know, pulling in stuff from autonomy, and there were just lots of guesses and speculation. Uh, I even saw one who was like, maybe it's the Lopin. Maybe the oh, Lopin gosh. is. A, but I think that the image that we have from that, A, there's a lot of spikes going on here. There's horns kind of coming out. The shoulders have spikes. The spikes are coming out of the elbows of this armor. And it reminds me very much of Canticle's topography and kind of Mm, like that, you know, brutal, ripped apart, obsidian spikes coming out, all of that jazz. But the image that we have from that Kickstarter includes exactly what you described, orange and black armor with kind of like the the veins or the cracked nature like oozing out orange. To me, it would be weird if Zellion only existed in this format on Canticle instead of in all of his appearances going forward. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my guess. Again, because Zellion is spiritually capital C connected to Canticle, he's going to carry that connection and that investiture with him and it will manifest in his armor the same way that when he became a Skybreaker, his Windrunner investiture 
you know, is still appearing in his armor. He's got both, he says. Usually it's the two blues. It's Windrunner blue and Skybreaker blue. So it's not like they have to be one or the other. So he's just collecting them. And now he's added this red orange of Canticle to the mix. Definitely a little bit more akin to Hoy, just only collecting armor patches. Yeah. Like that's yeah. all he's upgrading is just new armor <laughs> when he's going around. Okay. That is sort of the climax for Zellian. Let's talk about his new name, Zellian, becoming this new person. He says, quote, such an odd thing, spiritual connection. He couldn't even rightly say what it would do to him. Some uses of investiture were easily quantified. Others were, well, as arcane as the human soul itself, end quote. Now, we are told the meaning of Zellion is one who finds, and also that it has its origin at Yolin. Yeah. Which was surprising because the Threnodites are just like going deep. The Threnodites didn't even know, know the name. Yeah. what language it came from. Zellion is the name of the original Threnodite lodestar who led them to the planet of Canticle. And so it's kind of in their uh, mythology, but they are unaware of the origin. And it is Nomad who tells them it's Yolish. It's from the kind of original Cosmere planet. Certainly makes me think that the Threnodites are important and maybe deeply connected to the history of the Cosmere, mm -hmm. even though they're not a shard planet. Yeah, this is another thread that is tying this story, Zellion, the Threnodites, to Hoyd, to Yolin, back to, you know, the original Shattering. And I think this thread is going to sort of continue extending until we get to the Dragonsteel book telling Hoyd's story. Definitely. And Ox has some thoughts as well on what's going on, or maybe just some additional perspective. He says this, quote, But here's the thing, Zellion. Here's what you never understood. I also swore to be better than I was. I became a Knight Radiant. I spoke the words. And whatever you did, I never betrayed my oaths. End quote. This is a, a little fascinating statement. Yeah, a little harsh, but also really reminds me of Maya's huge moment mm, in yeah, number four. Uh -huh. Just like we chose. Like yeah. I did this. The friend have agency. Exactly. Yeah. And we shouldn't discard or kind of like disrespect the Spren's sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Ox's sacrifice because the human characters are the one that we follow yeah. around. Like these people are also night radiant. And that's what I think is really interesting. I thought that was so interesting. And I think it reframes this idea of the Nahel bond as a partnership where both parties are consenting to the oaths. Mm -hmm. And that bond still exists. Some aspect of Night Radiant exists as long as one party of the partnership has maintained their oaths. That's a really great I insight. Think. Yeah, no, yeah. I, th I think you're accurate. And I think that's what's on display here is there's far more going on with that Nahel Bon than we realize at first blush. We talked before about the concept of like uh, a lover and a pet kind of like the the wind spren being the pet mm -hmm. and the honor spren being the lover there's certainly a consenting nature that should exist with everybody's pet your pet should like you you should like your pet but true consent can only be given among equals and that's like one of the big kind of like conversations yeah. and topics that we have in this world all the time <laughs> But you have to kind of be on equal footing. And previously, we may have not placed the spren on equal footing. But yeah. I think we definitely should. Yeah. And that, that we should see this as this is a partnership and a, like a consenting agreement that both of us are getting into. And simply because you decide one thing doesn't mean that changes what I did or the choices that I made. Yeah. Because they were meaningful to me and to our partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And I'm glad you brought up Maya because this moment when, and this is happening at the end of the book when Ox is sacrificing himself for Nomad, brings up a lot of questions for me about how this all works. After Ox sacrifices himself, quote, dreams, ideas, and honor burned away in a moment, end quote. 
we hear that, quote, this sword was now a corpse, one truly separated from the soul that had inhabited it, end quote. My question is, how is this different from Maya? So I think on its face, this blade is now going to look the same as the dead spren blades that we've seen on Rashar, but we know for a fact that Ox literally does not exist. So this is not the same thing as Maya being a dead-eye spren in the cognitive realm and also appearing as a dead-eye spren blade. I agree. It is not that case. Where I would say the difference is would be if Maya was stabbed by the new technology, the swords and stuff coming out of Ashar and his weird, creepy spren killing stuff. Yeah, the racium. Exactly. If she was stabbed by that, then it would go away. It would be completely disconnected from everything that Maya was. But there is still some tanavastium or corvellium that makes up the physical sword itself. Mm, and that yeah. is enough to like keep it in that form. My guess, this has not been confirmed in any way, but my guess is it would lose the magical ability to like pop in and out of space. Okay, that was my question. Does it still like melt into the cognitive realm when you're not using it? Or is it now more like a regular blade where you have to carry it around all the time? I think it's like that. And I think okay. that's another difference that we see with Nightblood. And you cannot change it into anything else. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that those restrictions that we understand with regular shard blades like Maya mm -hmm. on Rashar are probably wrong in a lot of ways. And sure. Adolin yeah. is probably demonstrating that you can reforge a connection with the dead Spren because they're not, quote unquote, actually dead. They're dead as Spren die. They're dead eyes. Yes. Not dead. Exactly. <laughs> and that function of being a dead eyes means that Maya is no longer connected to her bonded mate to her night radiant and like a lover who loses someone that they've been bonded with for a whole life it may be impossible for that person to find another but it doesn't mean that everyone is prevented from finding another you might have a yeah you're talking about adolin potentially like reforging a nahel bond with maya a stronger then... bond with maya i think he already has as is exemplified by the fact that he can call Maya quicker than 10 heartbeats. Yeah, but I don't think they're all the way to a Nahel bond. Correct. I yeah. don't necessarily think it's a Nahel bond. There may be like some hard limits, but I think that what he is basically doing is giving her a body and soul to connect with again, which helps like heal her in some ways, as we see with all Spren bonds. What is different in this instance is that now Ox is completely gone from the equation. There yeah. is no dead eyes. There is no anything anymore that represents Ox. Yeah. There it's used to be just the Tanavastium blade. Exactly. And there used to be like a little kernel of Ox dead eyes within Nomad. Mm -hmm. And now that is gone too. And so the only thing is the physical blade itself. But we haven't seen any use of that blade, including I don't think we've seen it missed out or, you know, become a non-blade entity. He's carrying yeah. that when he shows up on the new mm. planet. I don't think he has snapped it away or whatever you want to call it. Dismissed it. Yeah, dismissed it. Yeah. Okay. That brings us to the end of the book and the end of Zellian's story so far as we know it. I have just a couple of intriguing tidbits for us here at the end. Yeah, hit me with your tidbits. One is very small. It's this, quote, even you can't outrun that light. He kept trying. Sunheart clutched to his chest, end quote. This immediately brought to mind for me the story of Fleet, but instead of running from the high storm, Zellian is running from the sunlight. Yeah, it's definitely a great call. So similar. And Literally the running around the planet just like Fleet does. And the concept of him creating legends and us yeah. having a legend of fleet. <laughs> and now there's kind of a new one of running from the sun. Yeah, absolutely. And then as you were just talking about when Zellian skips away from Canticle and lands on a new planet, he runs into some people, quote, 
The people crewing the boat turned out to be Shodel, of all things. He hadn't known that there were enclaves of them off Yolen, end quote. And he kind of, he skips to this, like, beachy sort of planet. He's sitting by the ocean when he sees these Shodel in their boat. And I've seen some speculation that the planet Zellian jumps to is Utol in the Komashi system. That would put him right next to the planet that we spent so much time and are still talking about when it comes to that secret project number three. We witnessed a connection between those two planets, the the bus yes. that was sent over, you know, first contact coming during that story. I think it would be really interesting if the timeline of things maybe put Nomad, now Zellian, right next to Hoyd and Design. Well, who knows what the timeline we is, We don't know right? it at all. Like, does Zellian show up on Utol before the events of Yumi or after the events of Yumi or during the events of Yumi? We, to be fair, don't even know that he is actually on Utol. This is just speculation. However, there is a gorgeous picture in the hardcover of where he lands. And in that image, he is holding the sword. Ah, okay. So it is fully formed. And so that's where I'm pulling from. I don't know if those can be considered canon. Canon, yeah. uh, But I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, it never says anything about dismissing that blade at the end of the story yeah not that i remember okay this has been a monster series already (laughs) we've only talked about the journey of one character and we have a lot of long dense episodes coming up i think next we're going to talk about the planet and the investiture so getting into this very weird very cool planet of canticle to talk more about the, as you were saying, electricity type Mm -hmm. situation that's going on and all of the different ways that investiture is manifesting on this planet. So much fun so far in the book club, a lot more in store. Brooke, can you take us away? Until next time, life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination. 